Uh, how many of you guys have ever studied ancient Sparta? It was a city-state in, in Greece. Maybe you've seen a movie about the Spartan army. The Spartan army was crazy successful during their period, period of time. And look, there's a lot not to admire about the Spartans. They were a very warlike people. They put very little value on human life. But there was something about the army that you had to really appreciate and respect. And it's something that the church needs today. The Spartan army was really unified. And so back during that period of time, it wasn't real normal for an army to be unified. Generally, ancient armies would just line up against one another in some big field. They'd yell insults back at each other for a little while. And then they'd take off running as fast as they can and meet together in the middle and have all these individual battles. And and that worked all right until you met the Spartan army. Because the Spartan army did something very different. They lined up in precise columns and rows where the first three rows would have their shields interlocked. And then the spears of the first three rows that were long enough that they'd go out over the first row of shields. And then when the battle started, they would jog together in perfect unison, just moving as one unit. And then when they would hit the other army, it was like a wall of spears collapsing in on the other army that was disorganized and all individual. And so that wall would just push them back and begin to win the battle. They were so effective that often the other side would run away when they saw the Spartan army come out onto the field. Generally, you knew you were going to lose when you faced the Spartan army. And so much of that was because they were unified. They were one. I don't know about you, but I am sick of election season at this point. Yeah, anybody with me? Yeah, I, yeah, that's worth clapping for. We're ready. Tuesday could not come soon enough for me. The thing I hate the most is political ads during football. Drives me nuts. You know, listening to those ads with lies and half-truths about the other side right in the middle of my football game. The only silver lining to election season is it's always also football season. Yeah, and I'm a huge football fan. A lot of you guys know I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. So I'm having a hard time finding joy in this season. But I like college games. I've watched lots of those. I've watched lots of pro games and high school games. You, you may not know this about me, but I have the right to be the voice of the center Rough Riders anytime I want to be and announce them on the radio. It's a, it's a big deal. It's a town of 4,500 people. I can go back and announce on the radio. A couple of my buddies are the voice of the center Rough Riders. And anytime I want to go back, I can be the voice of the center Rough Riders and do color commentary with those guys on the radio and on the internet. So I've, I've watched a lot of football and I actually know a decent amount about football. But I don't know what makes a good team a great team? Is that having a a defense that's great against the run or is it a defense that can really get after the pastor? Is it an offense that has a great running game or is it an offense that has an incredible quarterback and passing game? I, I don't know what makes a good team a great team, but I do know this. I know what can tear down a great team filled with great players and that's a lack of unity. Unity is incredibly important for any team. You know, one of our team goals here at Kara City for our staff comes out of this idea of unity. We say we want to be a team that's for one another. In other words, we want to cheer one another on. We want to think the best of one another. We want to be there for one another. And when we look back at the early church in the books of Acts, we see that initially they were very unified. It was all made up of Jewish believers who came from the same background and the same religion. And so they tended to be very unified. But over time, this unity became more difficult for them as they became more diverse. Now, Jesus wanted a church that was filled with diversity. That was his plan. They'd be made up of of Greek, I mean, of Gentiles, that's us, or non-Jewish people, along with Jewish people, people of different races and nationality, people with different backgrounds and political opinions. That was what he wanted. But when it began to happen and this new church began to grow, They started to struggle more with being unified. There were some things that separated them about their backgrounds. One of the biggest things was you have these Jewish believers and now you have all of these non-Jewish believers or Gentiles that are now in church together. And the Jewish believers started to say, look, to be a Christian, you gotta first be a Jew. So you gotta become Jewish, then you become Christian. Now, one of the big things to become Jewish is you gotta be circumcised. 
telling grown men they've got to be circumcised really cuts down on church attendance. It does. Some potluck dinner can't make up for that problem. And that was just one of the many things that divided that early church. Unity was, became very difficult for them. And unity may even be more difficult for us today. We're, we're separated by so many things, by race and gender, political opinions, and also about how the church should work. You know, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about this chest of drawers, and we've, we've talked about this idea that a lot of Christians have, that we have all of these different drawers, and that's how our life is made up, that they're all separate and distinct. And so we've got a finance drawer where, where all our money stuff goes and our debt and income. We've got our career drawer where our education and our current job goes. We've got a relationship drawer where our family background goes. We've got our politics drawer, that, that's where our political candidates go as long as the party we support. And then we think we've got a separate faith drawer and that's where our church stuff goes, our prayer life and our church attendance and our, any mission work that we do. And we think about this as being our life that's all separated with these little individual parts. And the problem with that is it's a real misunderstanding of what Jesus says about our life and what the Bible says about our life. Jesus would say your faith is not a separate drawer. Your faith is the chest of drawers. It's all of that. And every other thing comes out of that. In other words, your faith, your relationship with Jesus affects and changes all of these other drawers. And so when we separate those things out, we're not really making Jesus our king. We're making him our savior, but we're not letting him have access to some of these other drawers. And we've talked about that a lot over the last couple of weeks, but there's something else that having all of these different drawers in our life, these separate compartments, and where we've got our faith kind of separated out in its own drawer, another thing it does, it causes us to have division and disunity because we get broken up and we get separated by our politics. We get separated by our different socioeconomic status. Maybe we get where our, our racial background and our relationships come from. We get divided by all of those things. Whereas if our faith is the chest of drawers and everything about our relationship with Jesus defines who we are, then we have unity. And, and so we need to understand that. See, having a compartmentalized life, having a hard time saying compartmentalized life, doesn't just hurt our relationship with Jesus, it tears apart the unity of the church. And, and that's probably why just before Jesus was arrested, he prayed this prayer for unity for this church that was going to start after he rose from the dead and went back to heaven. So leading up to this passage in John 17, Jesus has been praying specifically for his apostles. But then in verse 20, it's going to change and he's going to start praying for this new church that was going to be diverse and look different. He was praying that they would be unified. Let's look at that together. This is John 17 verses 20 through 23. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. So he's been praying for the apostles. Now he says, I'm not just praying for the apostles. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. There's that word. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So right before Jesus goes to the cross, right before he's arrested, he prays this prayer for unity in the church. And I love this passage of scripture because it first gives us this picture of God the Father and God the Son working in perfect unity, living in perfect unity to further God's perfect plan. But then he says, just like God the Father and Jesus are unified, that we are to be unified in our relationship with Jesus. In other words, Jesus wanted this new church to be one family centered around who he is and what he's done. In other words, we're sons and daughters of the king, which makes us brothers and sisters with one another. So it's great that we're a family, but we don't want to be a dysfunctional family. That's the goal is not to be a dysfunctional family and to find union. And you know how this works. If you've ever been to a big family reunion or you've been to big Christmas or Thanksgiving gatherings, you know that family time can be awesome. 
It can be uplifting, relaxing, encouraging, and frustrating, discouraging, anger-provoking, and life-stealing, all on the same day. And church families can be the same way. We can either be unified by our oneness centered around who Jesus is, or we can be torn apart by all these different drawers that separate us. And I think this message of unity is even more important during this election season when we have such strong opinions about who should be our next president and which party we want to control Congress. See, Jesus understood that unity was not going to be easy for the church, but he also understood that it was absolutely necessary if the church was gonna accomplish its mission. So how do we navigate all of these differences, all of these things that separate us and find unity as one church, one group of believers? Let me first tell you where unity isn't found. Unity isn't found in uniformity of opinions. We are never all gonna agree on what political party, what president most represents our values. We're not. Unity isn't found in uniformity of opinions. We may disagree about other things. We may disagree about whether coffee should be iced or not. And it shouldn't, by the way. We we are gonna disagree about things. And if we're waiting to have uniformity of opinions, to have unity, never gonna happen. Here's something else that doesn't cause unity. Uniformity of all these drawers. We're, We're never gonna be exactly the same. We come from different cultural backgrounds. We come from different political thoughts and ideas. We have different amounts of money. We have different jobs and education. We are never gonna have uniformity in all of those life situations. Here's where unity is found. Unity is found when we recognize that we are one church worshiping one God with one mission. That should unify us more than all of these other things bring us apart. We may strongly disagree about politics. We may have different backgrounds and relationships, but unity is found through the common bond that we have in our relationship with Jesus. Jesus says he and the Father are one and we are one through our connection to him. And that's why we say that faith needs to control all these other drawers because when faith is the chest of drawers, that's what unifies us. It's what brings us together. We are unified by King Jesus. And look, if we're gonna be united in our allegiance to King Jesus, it makes sense to look for just a minute for at who he is and what he's done. That there's never been a king like Jesus. Throughout human history, there've literally been thousands of kings and emperors and princes and prime ministers, dictators and presidents. These leaders have conquered much of the known world. They built great palaces. They founded amazing cities. They have commissioned great works of art. They founded dynasties that would last for centuries. But none of these leaders have, has a legacy that even gets close to the legacy of Jesus. Jesus has been the subject of more adoration more scholarly study, more debate, more scrutiny, and more love than anyone else who's ever walked this earth. He is unique in that. Every recorded word of Jesus in the Bible is dissected and debated and torn apart in colleges and universities and seminaries around the world every single day. Jesus never wrote a book, and yet huge libraries can be filled with books about Jesus. He never painted a picture or commissioned art, and yet some of the world's greatest art is focused on his life and his ministry. Jesus never wrote a song that's recorded, and yet thousands of songs are sung every single day about him. His ministry on this earth lasted just three years, and yet his words are still being preached from this stage 2,000 years later. He never traveled far from home, and yet his message has spread all around the world. He never formed an army, and yet millions have died in his name. He had no formal education, and yet thousands of universities and seminaries are built to study him or built in his name. And so I want to look at two different passages of Scripture today that describe King Jesus. And what you're going to see in these two passages of Scripture is that they're very different. They don't seem to go together. But what you need to understand is that they are both King Jesus. You cannot have one without the other. And and I want to start with a description of Jesus during his earthly minister 
ministry. This was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. And what Paul's trying to do here is to tell the church how to live, to live as a servant, to live in love, to live with an idea of sacrifice. And here's what he says. He, he says, let me show you what it looks like by Jesus' life. So he says in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In other words, be like Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." So what Paul is saying is, look, let me tell you how to live like a servant, live a life of sacrifice. Because rather than me spending a long time trying to explain it, just look at Jesus. And, and what I love about this short description of Jesus here is it's backed up by every story that's told about Jesus in, in the gospel books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. From the very beginning, when, think about this, the God of the universe was born in a dirty, smelly barn. We call it a stable because it sounds prettier and it looks pretty sitting up on the mantle. That's not what it was. It was a barn with nasty, smelly animals all around him. That's where he was born. And then there's story after story that I could tell you. We could be here till after dinner telling stories about Jesus. You'd never come back to church, so I'm not going to do that. But it goes all the way until we see his death on a cross. He allowed himself to be nailed to a cross to suffer and die. And that is the example that's set. And so Paul is saying, look at Jesus. It's a whole lot easier to see by looking at Jesus how to live than it is for me to try to explain it. And, and there are certain things that just need to be shown rather than explained. You know, there's some things that just don't work very well if you try to explain. Just think about trying to explain to your child how to tie their shoes without, without showing them. Think about trying to describe how you uh, loop this loop around that, this lace goes under, then you pull it back through, and then you tie loops around. It doesn't make any sense. Or, or how to ride a bicycle without getting the bike out and showing them how to balance and steer and pedal. Even if something is simple, think about trying to describe someone to someone the difference between left and right without showing them or making some indication. It's hard to do. There are some things that are just better shown. A picture can be worth a thousand words. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, let me show you a picture of what it looks like. And, and what's amazing about our king is that he came to earth to show us how to live. He didn't just tell us how to live. He showed us how to live. But he came to do much more than that. He came to forgive us of our sins so that we can live with him in eternity. Look back at verse eight in Philippians two. It says, Jesus, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's what Jesus came to do. That was his ultimate purpose of why he came. Here's a very simple explanation of the cross. And look, for you guys that have been around church a while, I think there's gonna be this tendency to kind of go, I got that preacher and maybe not listen quite as carefully. But, but I want you to listen really careful about this amazing thing that was done for you and appreciate what your king did for you. Jesus is God. He was in this perfect place where he was worshiped and served and ministered to by thousands of angels. And he left all of that. He came to this messed up place called earth where he could feel pain, he could get sick, he could feel the sadness of death and problems. He came and he lived a perfect life, never made one mistake, even though he faced the same temptations that you and I face that cause us to stumble and fall. He lived this perfect life so that he could be the perfect sacrifice. And then he willingly allowed himself to be nailed to a cross, to suffer for hours and die for me and for you. And he did something even more amazing than that. He took all of the wrath of God. You know, God is a perfect God that cannot stand sin, can't even stand to be in the presence of sin. And so because God is a just God, there has to be a penalty or a punishment for that sin. And Jesus 
took all of that on himself. Look at how 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. This is Paul talking here. And he says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus took on all of every sin you've ever committed. He's taken on the sins you haven't even committed yet. And he took all of that on himself. And you know, there was actually something even more amazing than that. There's a moment where the Bible tells us that God the Father actually turned away from Jesus. Couldn't look at him. Couldn't be connected to him because he saw all of that sin. He saw our sin. And I think that maybe that was the worst part of suffering for Jesus on the cross. Because think about this. God the Father and God the Son had been one unified God together in perfect harmony and perfect unity for all eternity up to that point. And in that moment, for the first time, there was separation. And I think maybe that was worse for Jesus than the physical pain of the cross. We worship a king who has experienced everything that we go through. He experienced sickness. He experienced the, the sadness of other people dying. He experienced the sting of his own death. No matter what you've gone through, no matter what you're going through, our King Jesus understands that. And that's what Paul was describing in 2 Corinthians, when he's talking about Jesus. Jesus loves us so much that he died so that through his death and his resur resurrection, we become the righteousness of God. In other words, when God the Father looks at me now, he doesn't see all of my mistakes and failures. He sees me through the lens of Jesus' blood. And he sees me with Jesus' perfection. That's the same way he sees you if you're a follower of Jesus. And I think about it this way. I mess up all the time. I don't have to go back weeks or months. I can just look at this weekend. I have failed Jesus this weekend. Every single day, I mess up in some form or fashion where I don't treat my family the way I should, where I don't treat my friends the way I should, where I get puffed up and filled with pride. I don't serve people the way that I'm called to. I don't share my faith when I get an opportunity. Time after time, I fail Jesus. And yet... He sees me as holy and blameless and pure because Jesus nailed my sin to the cross and he nailed your sin to the cross as well. Look, I don't know what your sin struggles are, but I do know this, Jesus died to take that sin away. No matter how big your sin is, no matter how bad you've messed up, Jesus' sacrifice is big enough to take care of your sin. He died for your sin and your failure on the cross. So Philippians 2 paints this beautiful picture of the humility of Jesus, this sacrifice. But, but that's not the end of the story. That's not all of who King Jesus is. Our King just isn't a humble man willing to sacrifice for his children. He's also powerful and mighty and holy and righteous and filled with justice. He's worthy of our praise and adoration and obedience. Look at this description of King Jesus when he returns again. This is from Revelation 19, 11 through 16. He says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Sounds a little different than the description in, in Corinthians, doesn't it? But these are both equally King Jesus. That's who he is. He is both the humble servant in Philippians 2 and he's the warrior king in the book of Revelation. He's the prince who was slain and he's the king who will reign. He's one and the same. You, you cannot have one without the other. You cannot make Jesus your savior without also making him your king and your Lord, giving him control of all of those boxes. And, and look, if you haven't made Jesus your savior and your king, I've got some bad news for you. God hates your sin. And I'm just being honest. This is right out of the Bible. I'm not trying to be mean this morning. God hates your sin. It makes him angry. 
And that anger is directed at you. But Jesus died and took that on himself. So that if you follow Jesus and you make him Lord and King, that righteous anger of God was already taken care of on the cross. But you have to do something. I've, I've heard it said that if, if a thousand steps separate us from God, Jesus has taken the first 999 to bring us closer together. But you've got to take the last one. You've got to decide to make him Savior and Lord. You have to respond. Listen to John three sixteen through 18. This is how it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Listen to this last part. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. That's the gospel message. That's who King Jesus is. You have to choose to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be and that he's done what he claimed to do and to make him your savior and your king. Jesus is where our hope is as individuals, but he's also where our hope is as a church. He, he's our real hope for the future, not this government in America. Whatever you think about the current government or what it might be three months from now. Because here's the thing. Jesus won't enact any laws or policies that are wrong. His plan is perfect. He'll never be voted out of power because his term limit is eternal. He doesn't need the approval of Congress to act. His power is absolute. He's all present, all powerful. And keep in mind, God isn't going to be surprised on Wednesday morning. He's not going to look at the election results and go, wait, what? No, he is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He is all of those things. He is king. He moves presidents and senators around like chess pieces on a chessboard. We can have confidence going into Tuesday because we worship and follow a king who's already won. He is not up for election. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And in him, in him alone, we have hope and confidence for our future. See, Christians and even church leaders, they begin to try to make political leaders and political parties the savior and the protector of the church. But that, that hope is misplaced. They are not the savior. They are not the protector of the church. Our protection as a church doesn't rest in our government. Thank goodness, right? I mean, we don't want that. Our protection lives in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, and let me shoot really straight for you for just a second. If next week you're going to be devastated and disillusioned, if your party and your president doesn't win, your hope's in the wrong place. It's okay to be disappointed. You can have hopes for political reformation and restoration and all of those things. But if you are disillusioned, and you are depressed over what happens, you are misplaced in your hope. Your hope is in King Jesus, not in this government. See, as Christians, our primary citizenship isn't in the United States of America. We are first and foremost citizens of the kingdom of God. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says this in Philippians 3, 20 through 21. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, our hope, our savior, our protector is coming from heaven, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. That's where our primary citizenship was. That's where our primary hope is. And as a church, that should be what we're focused on. Because that's what Jesus was focused on. Jesus was focused on a way bigger kingdom than the Roman Empire or the kingdom of Israel. He was focused on the kingdom of God. And here's why that should be our primary focus too. That kingdom is eternal. And if we really believe what the Bible says, if we really take that to heart, that depending on whether we make Jesus our savior and king and Lord determines where we spend eternity, Shouldn't we be more worried about changing people's hearts than changing their votes? Let me ask you, do you really believe that whether you share your faith or you invite somebody to church could make a difference in whether they go to a place called heaven or a place called hell? 
That's the mission of the church. It has eternal consequences. It's so big that it extends past this lifetime. We have to be unified around who Jesus is so that we can accomplish our mission that will ring into eternity. And see, then if the church is primarily focused and rallies around King Jesus, we're going to have unity because that's going to unite us together. But if we are choosing political sides and we're letting all these drawers tear us apart, we're going to find it hard to have unity because we're going to all be choosing sides. In our culture today, there's so much pressure to choose sides. Are are you a Republican or, or are you a Democrat? Are you a liberal or are you a conservative? Are you for immigration or are you against immigration? Are you for Starbucks or against Starbucks? Even the choice of coffee separates us. And my daughter and I, we're on opposite sides of that debate. She loves all of their iced latte drinks. I think between us, it's overpriced, mediocre coffee. Now, therapy has helped us. (laughs) It's drawn us back together despite our disagreement about this very divisive issue but we're all pressured to choose a side. Our our culture, our friends, sometimes even our church is trying to make us choose a side. But as Christians, we don't choose sides. We are chosen. And that's a big difference. But, But we actually do something that's even worse than just choosing a side. We choose a side and then we want to act like Jesus is on our side. And, And so we tell people that, agree with us, you know, Jesus is on the Democratic side or Jesus is on the Republican side. Jesus is on this church's side because, you know, we teach the right way and we do the right things as opposed to some other churches that, well, let's just say they do them differently. And and we want to put Jesus on our side. And then because we think we're somehow on the side with Jesus, we feel empowered to speak harshly with people that disagree with us. We feel empowered to post hateful comments on social media in response to those who dare to voice a different opinion on some issue. I, I want to let you in on a little secret, though. Jesus is not on your side. He's not. Do you know whose side Jesus is on? Jesus is on Jesus' side. That's it. And you see that in his ministry. There were two different groups of, of, of Jewish leaders, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were were very conservative and they were very traditional. The Pharisees were less so. And both of those groups pressured Jesus to be on their side. And he never would pick a side, never chose between those two groups. And so both groups got mad at him. There was a group of Jewish believers who desperately wanted to overthrow the Roman government by force. And they thought, surely, surely Jesus would be on their side. At one point, they even tried to make Jesus by force a king. And he wouldn't do it. He didn't choose their side. Jesus wasn't on anyone's side. Jesus is on Jesus' side. And we are chosen to be on his side. The important thing about us isn't the side we choose in some of these boxes. It's that we are chosen. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples when they're walking from where they had the last supper to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus would be arrested. This is John 15, 18 through 19. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. He's saying you are chosen to be on Jesus' side. When we follow Jesus, we're no longer separated by these boxes. We are all one because we are on Jesus' team and Jesus' side. Remember back in in junior high when you guys would play, and I remember this a bunch, you'd be playing a game out on the playground. Maybe it was dodgeball or it was football or baseball or whatever it might be. And the two best, best athletes would normally choose the teams. And they would go back and forth, you know, picking the team. Do you remember the discomfort you felt when you were waiting to hear your name? There was this discomfort because you didn't know how long it was going to be before you were chosen, and you sure didn't want to be that last person that winds up on the other team by default. Everybody groans when it happens. Right? There was this discomfort you felt. But then when your name was called and you were chosen, you had this peace because you were now on a team. Here, here's some comfort I want to give you in this sermon today. You are chosen to be on Jesus' team when you follow him. But here's the hard truth. It's not your team. It's Jesus' team. 
He gets to decide the priorities. He gets to decide the rules of the game and the strategy for the team. That's not your choice. And see, when we understand that we're chosen to be a part of Jesus' team, then we can reach out and we can love and make friends and we can worship together and lead together and serve together with people who look different than us, think different than us, vote different than us. We can love them and encourage them. We have to assume the very best of each other, even the people that vote differently than we do, even the people that think politically or socially different than we do. We're chosen to be part of a team and a family that is rallied and unified around this one truth that Jesus Christ is king. One of the most dangerous trends I see in the churches today is this idea that somehow we can't worship together, we can't serve together, we can't lead together unless we all agree on that politics drawer. That's a dangerous thing because it causes disunity, it pulls us apart. It also keeps us from effectively sharing the gospel with the 50% of the people who vote differently than we do in our community. It's a dangerous trend because we are unified by one thing and it's not politics. Here's an important takeaway for you as a Christian when it comes to this election on Tuesday. Jesus is probably way less concerned about who you vote for than he is about how you treat the people that voted differently than you. You can be right in your opinion about something and you can be terribly wrong in the way you treat other people. I think so often we tend to hang out and socialize and be friends with people who look like us, who think like us, who talk like us, who vote like us. That's not what Jesus did. He went out of his way to be friends with and to socially engage with and to spend time with people who were different than him. Look, I have strong political opinions. I do. But some of my very favorite Christians are people who are going to vote different in this election than I do. I've even had staff here at at Karis City at different points in time, and I know those people probably voted differently than I did. And that's okay. My job as the lead pastor is not to make sure we're all politically on the same page. It's to make sure we're unified around who Jesus is, what he's done, how do we respond, and how do we live that out. That's what we're called to do. That's what unifies us is King Jesus. Our focus is unity, not uniformity. Well, we're not looking for uniformity of opinions. We're looking for unity of purpose. Here at Kara City, we want to be a church that looks the way heaven looks, with people of all different types, of, that look differently, that sound different, come from different places, have different thoughts and political and cultural backgrounds. We want to be focused and unified around King Jesus. What matters most is that we love Jesus with all our hearts. We love one another passionately and we get out into this community and we share intentional grace with other people one person at a time. That's way more important than what political party we we choose or who we vote for. We are one church. And if we're gonna be the church that changes this city and has an impact on this world, that's the church we gotta be. We have to be unified about around the gospel despite our differences. See, Paul talks about this unity that we're having. He's writing to the church in Ephesus and and he's gonna talk about what it looks like to have the unity that I've been preaching about. And so I want us to do something different. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. I I don't wanna just read it to you. I I want us to read that together. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna read this passage of scripture that's gonna go up on the screen, hopefully pretty quickly. Yep. And we are gonna read this all together. And as you read these words, don't just say the words, but understand This is unity. This is where it comes from. Let's read it together. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. That's unity. All hail King Jesus. Let's pray.